Get ready! You're tuned in to Tea Time Unfiltered with your girl, Lovely T, bringing you the hottest trending topics on social media. Stay connected. Instagram.com slash Lovely Tea 2002. Hey, you guys. Welcome to another episode of Tea Time Unfiltered with your girl, Lovely T. Yay! Hey, you guys. Happy Monday and welcome to another episode of Tea Time Unfiltered. So I hope you guys are doing good. So I want to come on here and just talk about um, some things that's been on my mind. And I want to talk about this story that I covered about two, three years ago. And what kind of made me think about this story again was because yesterday during my live stream, I was talking about the whole Madonna situation. How I said, you know, sometimes I, you know, walk over to her Instagram page just to check on her black children, just to make sure that they're okay. And, you know, they're being fed and loved and everything else. So, um... Afterwards, I got to thinking about this young black boy that I did a story on. And this month, the month of March, is going to be the three-year anniversary of his death. And for y'all who don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about the little young boy. His name was Devontae Hart. He was the one who was dressed like a child from like the 60s or 70s. And he goes up and he hugs a police officer and the, and the picture goes viral. And I remember even way back then in 2014, it was during the whole Ferguson uprising. It was when Michael Brown was killed and Darren Wilson got off and folks were going crazy all over the nation. And he went to a rally in Portland, Oregon. And so you see the video of this young black boy who's dressed like he's from the 70s and he's crying. And he's hugging the police officer. And I remember when I first saw the picture, it just did not sit well with my spirit. I'm like, something's not right there. And this was before the whole Get Out movie. But once the movie Get Out came out, it, it made me think of this young boy. Because the outfit, the hat, that's not how a 12-year-old dresses in 2014. So it was something about that that didn't sit well. Just the way he was dressed, the way he was crying. It seemed way more emotional for him than it should have been. Then we find out that he has two mothers. They're white lesbian women, and these were his mothers. So to me, I kind of felt like there was some propaganda behind all of this, but nobody could foresee the tragedy that was going to befall this family. So I want to go ahead and play you guys a quick flashback of when Devontae's picture went viral all over the nation. So y'all go ahead and check this out. Finally tonight, it's been six days since the grand jury declined to indict Darren Wilson for the shooting death of Michael Brown. Many of the images that followed have been ugly. This one is not. Here's Carter Evans. As Ferguson erupted into violence this week, the bitterness flowed nationwide in clash after clash between protesters and police. And then during a rally in downtown Portland, there was this encounter. 12-year-old Devontae Hart and Portland Police Sergeant Brett Barnum on patrol with his partner. I looked over and I said, is that kid crying? And he said, yeah, he is. Devontae, he says, had come with a sign saying, free hugs. Soon after came this indelible image, captured by freelance photographer Johnny Nguyen. As a photographer, you look at that scene, it's powerful, especially with what's going on now. A white American cop speaking to a young black American boy. And then when the tears started going away and they started drying up, I realized we had made a connection. They aren't the only ones who felt the connection. Since the photo first appeared Friday in the Oregonian newspaper, it's now been shared more than 150,000 times on Facebook. I didn't realize it was gonna have this kind of an impact, um, but, it, but it's a pretty special thing. A moment between a 21-year police veteran and a 12-year-old kid. Devontae's mother wrote on her Facebook page that he struggles with living fearlessly when it comes to the police and people that don't understand the complexity of racism that is prevalent in our society. We're humans, and that's exactly what this was that on that day, was I'm human, and I want to reach out to a child and just say, hey, are you okay? The other aftermath of Ferguson. All right, so you guys just saw that picture. And so, you know, a lot of things ended up coming out about Jennifer and Sarah Hart. You know, a lot of things ended up coming out about them. They had adopted six minority children. And I remember even watching old YouTube videos of Devante and his siblings. It was just weird. Like, these kids were just not raised like normal kids. They seemed, you know, somewhat happy, but everything seemed very, very forced. You know, he'd be up dancing in his underwear, you know, dancing with a guitar. 
like the whole life just seemed like a real big facade. And so then it came out that neighbors had been calling the police and calling Child Protective Services on these two women. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of do a breakdown and give you guys a backstory of everything that went down. So Jennifer Jean Hart and Sarah Margaret Grano, they grew up about 150 miles apart in South Dakota, and they met at Northern State University. By 2005, they were living together in Alexandria, Minnesota. Investigative documents say that they had provided foster care for a 16-year-old girl who had to be removed from their home in February of 2006 because of her suicidal idolizations and threats. The couple were planning to adopt, but they said that they didn't want that negative energy to impact their children. So they ended up giving her back to the state. Now, the first three set of children that they had was Marcus, Hannah, and Abigail. They were placed with the hearts on March 4th 2006. So a month after the 16-year-old was removed from the home, they allowed these two women to adopt three more children. So the adoption was completed six months later, and within the year, the women had spent at least 15 hours training on topics like racial diversity excitement, helping abuse kids heal, and things like that. And because of them being willing to learn more about, you know, black culture and minority culture and things like that, the caseworker, the caseworker in Ferguson Falls, Minnesota, they basically deemed them, you know, worthy of adopting a second group of sibling children. So the first group, they were siblings. Then the next group that they end up adopting, they're also siblings. So Jeremiah, Devante, and Sierra, they were adopted in June of 2008. The documents showed that Jennifer and Sarah married in Connecticut the following year. In March 2009, in an email, Jennifer shared plans for the family's next steps. Sarah's trying to get pregnant, she wrote. After 10 years of talking about this, we've decided on a donor, Jennifer wrote. This month will be the first time she will have done the actual procedure. It's very nerve-wracking. But by July, she wrote to someone else, stating that the doctor couldn't find the baby's heartbeat. And she updated the person six days later that the baby didn't make it. So the loss of that child, or their so-called biological child, um, they're thinking that that's what might have put a strain on their relationship and even made one of the women super emotional and upset. So that's when we start seeing, you know, signs of trouble in their relationship. So on August of 2010, um, in an email to another woman, Jennifer complained that, that Sarah had said some hurtful things to her. For quite some time, I felt very underappreciated, taken for granted in our relationship, and at times unloved, she wrote. While I know deep in my heart how much she loves me, she is horrible at showing it. I have felt that I have been raising all of these kids on my own and I need a break. A few months later, the Minnesota Child Welfare received a report of negligence and abuse by the hearts, two of which were deemed credible. In one episode, Sarah admitted to physically harming Abigail. Records show that Sarah was convicted of a misdemeanor domestic assault. The family then made their first major move to Lynn, Oregon, where an anonymous person told officials that the Hart children appeared malnourished and investigators in Oregon began an inquiry and interviewed the women who knew the family and described them as militant parents who imposed harsh disciplinary measures on their children. But any private turmoil was glossed over by their public videos and posts on social media, which portrayed a happy, eccentric, fun-loving family. Jennifer was prone to constantly show videos of Devante dancing and the other children singing, basically to show, you know, their community that they were being provided for. But if you really watch these videos, Devante does look malnourished. He looks a lot smaller than he should. You know, at the age of, you know, 9, 10, 11, he should be a little bit bigger than what he is, but he's very, very frail when you see him. He's literally in his underwear, which is disturbing enough, but the size of him, his legs and his arms, he just looks very, very thin. So then we fast forward to 2014, and in 2014, at a demonstration in Portland, Oregon, to protest police violence, Devante was photographed with a pained expression hugging a white police sergeant. The image went viral, and then it was time for them to move again. So by now, they're trying to be low-key. They got a lot of, you know, fame from this. I remember seeing them all over the news and on television and doing interviews and things like that. But they kind of wanted their peace again. They wanted to just kind of remain, you know, just, just go back to how they were living prior. 
So then by May of 2017, the Hearts were living on more than two acres of land in Woodland, Washington. The only other two homes nearby were shrouded by trees and fences. Bruce and Dana DeCab lived in one of them. They told investigators that they had been excited to have new neighbors, but they rarely saw anyone from the property and they initially wondered if the family had in fact moved in. They had. Then one night, around 1.30 in the morning, on August 2017, Hannah rang the doorbell at the DeCab's house and ran inside their home. The DeCab said in the interview she was missing two teeth and was so thin that they thought she was six or seven years old. But in actuality, she was a teenager. Yo, what's up? Baby, let's go. Hey, tea sippers To listen to the rest of this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, Tuned In, or AnchorFM.com, which is a free podcasting site. Thank you guys so much for the support, and stay tuned for the next video.